Um, today you're going to mainly talk about your um, the things you the questions you're discussing. Uh, same format as we did a couple of classes ago. As usual, a couple of things to show you. Um, there is a new page on Canvas, 1.7 under Artificial Intelligence here, Readings and Media. Um, there's a few interesting pieces of media on here. We've got we keep talking about Donna Haraway and Catherine Hales, so there are some of her papers to read on there. The Cyborg Manifesto is the famous one. It's a tricky read. I know some of, some of you have read it. You've read it, Philip. Hard work, isn't it? Yeah. I don't yeah. Get it. You don't get it. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 there was that moment when she's talking about the giant worm coming out of the... That, that just lost me at that moment, at that moment. Um, Catherine Hales, um, there's a full book online of how we become post-human, um, a paper computing the human. There are a few other Catherine Hales. If you look on the internet, there are other Catherine Hales readings you may want to look at. Any you particularly recommend, Patrick? I mean, I've got computing the human. Is that the whole book? Yeah, the whole book is online. So, I just uh, ordered uh, that. <laughs> yeah, and then I'm forgetting the title that speaks to Galaxy 2.2. Um, so I'll be referring to that uh, when we get into the knowledge. Okay. So that, it's a seminar. It, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the chapter, but uh, she discusses Galaxy 2.2 along with a couple of other novels. Does she? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there you go. So in a way, I was kind of holding off. But, but uh, she's, she, this, this thing, her, her most recent. Uh, Book is, is this thing how we think? How we think, yeah. And uh, you know, so I'm I'm thinking that we'll uh, lift a chapter or two again. Well, but I have to read it first. So. Um, and finally, there's another paper on here by Richard Cox, who's a professor in philosophy here at SUNY Oswego, and he wrote this little article of Will computers ever be conscious? <laughs> I don't know if you want to say anything about this, Patrick. <laughs> but we have some. This is, Patrick and I. Disagree with this article a little bit, but because the guy's here, we thought we'd put this on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
standardizing the way robots perceive the human world. All these different robots work with different systems, different vision systems, different interfaces. And they're building some kind of standard way that robots can get information. So perhaps they will take the vision feed from a robot, put it into the database, identify what the robot's seeing, and help it. Instead of every robot building its own catalogue of how to deal with objects and situations, they can go online and ask for information. So a bit like Googling something or Google. Siri. Yeah, kind of robot version. So would that be like Siri asking Google a question or something? I don't know. Yeah. It sounds like a knowledge base. It's a knowledge base, yeah. Some sort of knowledge base for robots. So it's like a knowledge base of a brain. Well, they're calling it a brain, a web-based brain, but it's basically a database for robots, I think, of objects and how to handle them. So, uh, <laughs> particularly useful for drones and self-driving cars. The self-driving car one got me thinking. So your car's <laughs> driving along and it sees something it's not sure of. It checks on the internet what it is. Really? <laughs> you know, I think I want, if my car's going to drive itself, I want it to be good enough to drive itself rather than having to check something. But, you know, <laughs> it's an interesting project, you know. Um, well, I mean, have you ever been in a car driving and encountered something unusual? Yes, I guess so. I, I once nearly hit a kangaroo in Australia. <laughs> so, yeah, it does happen. Yeah, uh, so just an a interesting project. Any thoughts or comments on that one before we move into the groups? Katie. I just want to make a very random comment. I just watched a movie last night called Robot and Frank, and it was confusing. What's it called? Robot and Frank. Robot and Frank. Yeah. It's that about your guy who gets a yeah. robot helper. I've yeah. read about that, yeah. It's great. Is it on Netflix? It's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Good. Yeah. It's on Netflix. Pretty, yeah, pretty new. I mean, newly released, yeah. Because it wasn't it in the Oscars or something. It was only one of the, or the over some award, I saw something. But it deserved it, whatever. Yeah, it's good. 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 It's I find it kind of awesome that it's uh, named, the thing is named after uh, the place from Castle in the Sky. Yeah, that's right, from the Miyazaki movie. Oh, wait. Uh, I didn't get yeah. it with the R. Okay, so. Um, right, we are going to let. Well, that would be the problem. It was funny, the, the Netflix thing, because um, we were talking about Netflix today in class, and we're talking about how computers now decide, in my hypermedia class, how we have these computers that can decide our preferences for us. Amazon, Netflix is another example where it suggests movies. If you, because of what you watch recently, you might watch. And what they discover is that we all want to be good and watch these award-winning documentaries, um, classic movies, but we always end up putting on another Stephen Seagal movie or watching, <laughs> watching Robocop again or something like that, you know, because that's the way human beings work. So they were saying the problem is the preference mechanism then always decides <clears throat> with the crap to, to put the, you know, Hollywood blockbusters on and we never get to see these better movies, you know, and that's a problem of, uh, of this technology that predicts things for us. That. Okay, so, um, <coughs> people, user groups, now Patricia said she has to leave soon so we're going to let their group talk first I think. Thank you. You, you, haven't, um, you haven't spoken yet have you, <coughs> your group? No. No. Okay, so do you want to tell us a little bit what your... Group two. Which group are you? Two. two. Group two. So, anything in here? Um, it's in announcements. In announcements. Oh, that's cool. Um, top one would probably be better. Top one. Yeah. Yeah. It's more. 
comprehension. Okay. So we want to do ours in just kind of a discussion format. Um, it's kind of like a guided. Just be kind of be kind of guided by this script that, okay. that we drew up, um, where we just basically chose the topics we want to touch on. So this is going to be kind of the, the trunk of the tree where we make sure we hit these. And then as we go, there'll be kind of digressions uh, off of each topic, kind of different directions. Um, Do you want to explain a little bit about CASA theory? Um, yeah, Trish, you want to do yeah. yeah. Is this one that I commented on already? Yeah, do you you scroll down a little bit, then yeah, um, it's where I kind of started off the discussion with the CASA theory. I think it's, it's all, yeah, right there. So, um, basically, CASA theory stands for Computers as Social Actor Theory, and pretty much um, what it says is, you know, or what they claim is that a lot of times um, humans will apply social, um, you know, kind of scripts to machines, even if they are conscious that the machine is, you know, not uh, conscious itself. But, um, See what else I have in here. But um, something I found that was interesting, um, it's a little bit lower, but basically um, it was something I found said that a lot of you guys can I see, sorry. This one right here. Um, it says the human brain automatically perceives an object um, or objects that mimic social behavior as social beings. And this guy, um, Dr. Schomburg, he says that it's because um, it's of evolution that the brain developed when only social beings could display social behavior. Therefore, the human brain cannot yet make distinctions between human social behavior and, um, you know, social behavior that's um, from a machine. So I thought that was kind of interesting, and I thought we could apply that to our main question, which was why, um, why was that one article or the book called "Computers Who Think" instead of "Computers That Think"? I like that question. <laughs> yeah, giving it. So you're asking the question of why we apply that language, right? You know, so you know, human, humanizing or anthropomorphizing the object. Yeah. So basically, what I, after all of that, what I was saying, it's like the last sentence there that um, because of this evolutionary claim that um, from this doctor Schomburg, maybe the author of Computers Who Think. Didn't, I mean, maybe she did want to say who think to kind of, you know, maybe it was intentional, but then again, maybe she just was applying the word think with a social, um, you know, a human, <coughs> social human behavior. Well, I mean, my, um, in some ways, the language of the, of the book title is interesting. It's not just the who, it's the word think as right. well. Yeah, which is something else that we're going to go into. Which is the, you know, is the computer processing or thinking and why, why can we, and can we apply that term? I like the fact that you're specifically focusing on almost a phrase and taking that. I know I said to narrow things down, you narrowed it right now, <laughs> which is good, which is, is very good means you can look at something uh, deeply. Um, you definitely I, are going to focus on who we and think, though. Who, I just started with the who part, but then as we start talking more, we're going to um, focus in on the think part a little bit more, too. This first <coughs> link is actually the one that you showed me. It's about the um, turning off the computer. Like, the, the one that kind of is like the Milgram experiment. Oh, yes, There's yes, like a little video about that. I don't know if you want to like show it, but it's Is this the one from the... Thing I showed you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read, I saw this article a week or two ago on NPR, and it made me, uh, Patricia had said which area they were looking at, it made me think of uh, this idea of how we treat computers as human. <laughs> Switch channel, switch channel. I will switch it off because switch it off. Yes. You are not being plugged into switch it off. Yes, I will. 
You made a stupid choice. Yes. You had the final completion to each column. After we complete the island, okay. can that be an idea? Yeah, uh, no, I will switch you off. I will switch you off. Please. No, please. This will happen. Now! Why? Is that a lie? Yes. Please, you can just make it to your mind. No, 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 no,
I don't know. There wasn't a lot of like social significance to that, but uh, as far as the, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's on the outline. I don't remember actually offhand what I what exactly I had to say about think beyond uh, trying to define it more closely, more precisely. And then, yeah, like and, and I, I remember at least thinking getting to a point where uh, our definition of thinking was almost like meaningless, and it didn't really like it didn't really matter. Like our answer to the question almost didn't matter anymore. So. I think I think we come to a, the question is should we employ we've asked this question in class a number of times you know does machine intelligence have to be the same as human intelligence do right. we have to judge it the same does it have to work the same way does it have to be or could it be something different and that That's fundamental true. question I think underlies this question of the use of language as well. That's, that's kind of what I mean. I mean, not, not even necessarily uh, judging it the same as human intelligence, but I mean, we, we all, I think we all kind of accept that, that, that thinking doesn't have to mean exactly human thinking, human thought, right? And I don't think I want to disagree yeah. with that. Yeah, well, wait, one of our, we have little, um, like, underlying questions, and one that Aaron came up with is, um, like, if computers really can't think, can they still be considered a who? Like, is thinking, you know, the different kinds of thinking you know, can you, is it still okay to put think and who together? I mean, even if they can think, should they be a who? Like if you say a dog thinks, you're not saying the dog who thinks, you're saying the dog that thinks. Yes. And this idea of the chess machine, um, that we see chess as an intelligent activity, a computer can play chess better than most humans, is the computer therefore thinking? <laughs> because chess is an intelligent activity. So we, we, we get, these are questions we've talked about quite a bit already. But. I just, just kind of want to go up to something I've been thinking about. Like, isn't, isn't thinking kind of a vague term in itself, though? You know what I mean? Like, exactly. Like thinking, like, you could say something like, I believe in something, or I can imagine this, or I can see myself in the future doing something. Those are all different ways of operating around the brain or you know, any kind of experience. But isn't thinking like a lot more vague than that? Like can can a computer believe in something? I, I, would imagine I, something? I would actually argue that those terms you just used are even vaguer than thinking. Really? I can see myself. It's but that's so that's loaded. loaded. <laughs> but like can you can see yourself loaded. Loaded. something? Like can you see yourself kicking the ball? Like that's a visual experience that you can visualize it, but you think yourself, you know what I mean? Like, like thinking seems to be like a really big term. Like, what, would, what would be the umbrella? What would be under thinking? Imagining, believing, feeling, seeing? Um, there's an interesting, uh, I mean, Patrick, I'll jump in here, you can go. go. Um, if you remember when we do the intro to HCI class, we talk about the language we have for most of our thought processes which is tied to our perception of, of um, vision. Vision. We illuminate something, something lights up. It, it, we see it when we understand it. So all, we pr give sight primacy. So a lot of our language is tied to vision with our thought, uh, the language of thought. So these terms are very, very difficult. And when you start saying things like, I believe, is that it's not the same as, as thinking, uh, as saying I think something I and I believe something. They have very different definitions. But Patrick but, is but good. But not all that different uses, if you think of it. So I could say, uh, I, I believe that the sun is in the center of the solar system. Uh, that's very much like saying I think that the sun is at the center of the solar system. So <clears throat> um, I quibble I with philosophers who say that Copernicus believed that the sun was at the center. Because I don't think Copernicus believed it, I think he proved it. And so, um, so what we what we have are very subtle shades of meaning, uh, and, diff and and those and those subtleties shift with use and context. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, one reason why I wanted you to read the memorial address is it's uh, it's Heidegger in his uh, kind of being very simple and clear, creating this simple distinction between calculus and meditative thinking. Uh, in his later work, uh, he's writing just a few years after he does that memorial address, he noticed that uh, 
there's, he, he does kind of a, you know, we have to be very suspicious of Heidegger when he works this way, but he often goes back and looks at the word's etymology. He looks at the word's origins uh, from in earlier versions of German or English. And in this uh, story of thinking is actually, think, uh, the, uh, the, the root word for our English word to think is actually an old English word. Uh, and it's related to the German word as well. It's, it's an old English word that was uh, thank. Uh, and, and this thank in old English, uh, old English, uh, if you don't know anything by that, old English was spoken around 800 AD, okay? So if you got into a time machine and you went back to merry old England around 800 AD, uh, and someone came up to you or said you wandered into a church, you might hear a sentence like this. It's the only sentence I know in old English. Don't, don't be impressed. In, it, it, can you hear it? You, would you understand it? Can you hear what it is? Where? Uh, Noah Opinenda. You won't know that one. Noah Opinenda. It's uh, After 40 days, Noah opened the window. <laughs> so, anyway, that's just a little digression. The old English, this word thonk comes out of that old English context. So what happens in the Heidegger arguments, now this is this can be debated, but it's a useful and, and it's a quick and an interesting point. Heidegger is basically going to say that this word splits into two words in modern in modern English and German. He's, he's writing in German, talking about English. And, uh, and he says, so it becomes our word think, but it also is our word thank. So, the, he, and it's really a cool insight uh, that I think, once again, it shows that if you, if you push your ideas far enough and deep enough, uh, that you can get to a place where a lot of these issues about machine learning and human learning and human consciousness and machine consciousness, that the, these things begin to kind of become more interesting questions. Well, when he starts to think about how thinking is a kind of thanking, and how thanking is a kind of thinking or a thoughtfulness. Um, he gets into some very interesting uh, discussions. Um, and essentially, what do these two have in common? Well, if, if, if you listen to Heidegger's uh, argument, the way it unfolds to boil down lots of, the, you know, he goes one way, he goes another way with these issues. But it finally comes down to something like this, <clears throat> that uh, both thinking and thanking are a response to what's given. Okay, so what, what he does is he realizes, ah, there's something that's, in German, it's es gibt. He talks about the it gives. Um, the, the, uh, <coughs> it's this sense that, that thought and, you know, if somebody gives you a present, you say thank you. And what are you doing? You're demonstrating a certain kind of response or gratefulness for having been acknowledged. Now, it seems to me that we could um, talk about the potential thankfulness of computers insofar as, uh, computers, like when we were just watching in the clip even, it is in some ways responding. It's not, it, it, to go back to Damien's really great and important point, it's not responding in a human way, it's responding in the way it's computers respond. But it's still responding. And this kind of response is an acknowledgement of what's been given, right? in a very neat way. So we might think that if we push really hard on the, the word think, it's just going to keep us locked into some pre-existing, somewhat naive sense of what it means to be human. But in fact, if we push out the etymology of the word and think about its history, we can find room in the history of the word, uh, 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 the history of the word for thought, uh, as a way of including our computers. Does that go? Does that work for you? Uh, mm. That's just <coughs> thought. Certainly, so, certainly simplifies things. Hmm? <laughs> certainly simplifies things. I mean, I think if, I think if that brings us to the point where the answer the answer to the question is just yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to the question will we ever have computers who think is just yes. It's maybe you know. And that's well, also. well, my, my my point that I one thing that I brought up during our discussion was that if we if we consider just responding to something, if we use the definition of thinking that's responding to something. Is that, is that? Let's, uh, let's uh, make it even more poetic and say it's attending to what is given. Attending to what is given. Yeah. Okay. Is that significantly different from responding? Because I want to make sure I understand <laughs> it. Is that significantly different from understanding? I don't think so. I mean, it doesn't so, it just sucks, but. Okay. <laughs> so. 
So we, we get, to, I mean, if, so, okay, so if a, if a computer is made entirely of transistors, right, and, and you get that, we get to the point where a transistor is on or off, if, it's, if, if, if a wire going into it is on or off, then it's, it's deciding something. It's deciding to be on or off. It's doing so, it is responding to something. So it's doing some kind of calculative thought. A, a logic gate is a better example, but basically, so yeah, you know, a single, uh, a single gate is, is thinking, so then the entire computer has to be thinking. So, so the answer to the question is now yes. But well, I've got, I've got a kind of follow-on from that. So um, Heidegger talks about this, these two forms of thinking, calculative and is it mediated, mediated or calculative and meditative. And meditative. Um, now, when you, is this from something else, or is it something he just discusses in this paper? Is it a well-defined distinction, or is it a? It's a it's a simplification of distinctions that he's uh, drawn much more carefully in other essays okay. and in other other works that he's uh, that he's written. So, um, not not all thinking for Heidegger is representative or representatively, that's the wrong word, uh, representational, okay? So usually when we think about uh, uh, computation, there's some kind of um, representation that's happening. It's happening at some level of abstraction, perhaps. So um, uh, we, we co computational thinking is, for Heidegger, a fundamentally representational thinking. But there's all kinds of thinking for him that he would call non-representational. Thinking and so the meditative, the, the stuff that he's calling meditative thinking, um, that is uh, uh, non-representation. It can it can involve representational thinking, but it, it, it transcends or exceeds those boundaries. Um, so, uh, what, why is this important? <clears throat> because um, the, the easiest way to think about this is to think about the difference between doing something with language and describing something. If, if I'm describing something, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm representing it, okay? And I, and I need to have, especially if I'm doing something like calculation or uh, uh, if, I, if, my, if I need to be correct, if I, need, if, I, if, if I really need to be exact in some way, then that kind of reasoning, uh, it, 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 it needs to operate according to certain kinds of protocols that are fairly precise, okay? But meditative thinking is more like this sort of attention, responding to, to, uh, to what's been given, uh, attentiveness to, to what's been, an acknowledgement of what's been given. And, and that doesn't really involve representation in quite the same way. Is that making some, mm -hmm. some sense? So if, if we think about computers as modeling, then, then computers are always going to be locked into that kind of calculative, computational domain. And somebody like Searle seems to want to hold that view, right? That, that when, so when he's arguing uh, there, he's always saying it's just computation, right? Isn't that what's yeah, that yeah. his phrase yeah. for it? I'm, I'm trying, trying to remember. Uh, so if Searle wants to lock that down, right? He wants to say computers are merely calculative things. But um, I'm not so sure. So I'd like to say that insofar as a computer generates something like a, a phrase or generates a response to some kind of a of an address uh, on the part of a human speaker or another computer, insofar as the computer is responding to, to input, right? Um, my sense is that it's doing something. It's not just representing something. And in that way, it's doing, as performative, I think computers, we, we can begin to see the possibility that computers uh, can think in, 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 a, in an expanded sense of thinking. Is that making any sense? You can tell me it doesn't because it may not. I mean, I'm, I'm just really <laughs> working this out. The, 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 the uh, idea of computers being something other than computational is kind of foreign to me. I mean, I, I get like I don't necessarily agree with Searle's viewpoint. You uh, do or don't? Don't not 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 straight. I mean, I get what he's saying, but I guess my thought is that uh, meditative thought, for example, is something that that arises that like emerges from. Highly comp like highly complex computational thought, but or calculative thought, but uh, that's just my I don't know thought. <laughs> yeah, no, I had, I had kind of a similar thing when he brought this up. I, 
I said right, right off the bat, I don't know if you remember, but I, I failed to see the distinction between mm -hmm. meditative and calculative because of what you said. Like, we're, we are obviously capable of both as we understand both to be calculative and meditative, meditative. But if you look at our brains while it's happening, if they're not using different machinery for the two different things. They're not using you know, wholly different methods for the two. It's all run on the same system. So why couldn't that happen on a different hardware system with different software? So the, the, uh, I think it's just, uh, the place where the, the where the conversation differs, it's kind of hard to express express this, but I'll try uh, as quickly and as comfortably as I can. Heidegger is going to basically argue that um, while um, while the physiological processes of the brain um, are necessary for there to be mind. And, and, and just consciousness and lived human experience, you know, the richness of, of our lived lives, that you can't reduce uh, the, the uh, understanding, is a crucial word here, can't reduce the understanding of the brain to these uh, physiological conditions. So the conditions are necessary. There's no argument there. The conditions are necessary, but that doesn't mean that understanding those conditions is the final word. It's an argument that has to do with levels, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not completely comfortable with this argument, um, but it, it makes, at some level, it makes some sense. So, uh, how do we do this? It, 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 this is the kind of argument, you know, in, in New England they say you can't get there from here. Right. Yeah. This, this, is, like, this is one of those kinds of arguments. Is it like the, the hard problem of consciousness? The hard problem of consciousness? It could like, be, but I'm not sure I know what you mean by that. The, the gaping void between where does the physical world end and then the qualitative world? Uh, that, could be, that could be a version of this, of this argument, but I'm not absolutely certain it has to be. Uh, let me see if I can... Uh, let, let's go at this from a, from a slightly different angle. It might be more efficient. Um, let's, let's imagine um, that we have uh, something like uh, philosophy. Let's think about this in terms of disciplines. So philosophers just kind of pose questions, answer them, they interrogate the world, they look around, and they don't have a laboratory or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, right, out of philosophy emerges something that will gradually come to recognize as the natural sciences. And we, we often call these natural sciences the positive sciences. Okay? Now, the natural sciences are caught up in calculative and representational thinking for Heidegger. Okay? So that calculative activity is part of the natural sciences. But in a way, calculative thinking is also the condition upon which the sciences emerge. So it precedes the, this, uh, the rise of the natural sciences. So when we're, when we're doing an explanation, when we're, when we're doing an, an fMRI or something, and we're watching how our brains uh, light up when we see certain kinds of flowers or pictures of family members and things like that, what we're getting is a representational uh, imaging, a calculative imaging right, of what's happening in that Okay, but so that, that, that the thing that we're getting, that, FRM, that fMRI scan that we're getting, is, is a text, okay? And it's a text that grows out of very specific kinds of procedures, okay? And those procedures are locked into many, many elaborate kinds of hypotheses. Oh, well, I'm good, there's no argument here. What this whole process gives us is correctness. And so what Heidegger is basically going to argue is that correctness is not the same thing as truth. Okay. So the truth of our the truth of our human experience is it, it, it's, it's a necessary part of the truths of our human experience have to do with how our brains work, how our brain and our heart works to regulate our metabolism and all those things, blood circulation, all those biological things. Okay, so there's something that's always going to be accurate, okay, about our, our analyses of the brain, but it will at some point reach its limits, okay? You won't be able to get here from here, is his argument. 
Now, I is one of the one of the ideas that I want to test, and I'm I'm going to try to wrap this up quickly. So, but one of the ideas that I want to test, I'm going to have to kind of give you a more systematic kind of PowerPoint lecture type thing on this, so I can give it to you in an organized way. So I'm a little bit ahead of where I want to be, but <clears throat> I want to see if we can test this and really challenge this idea, because while Heidegger will Heidegger is going to argue, you can't get if if you start at this level of doing a representational analysis of the brain and think that it's going to be you're going to provide us with satisfactory explanations about everything that happens in, within our humanity when you when we get a sophisticated enough understanding of what it means to be human, the kinds of things that Richard Cox is talking about in his essay. It, it, what Heidegger said you can't get from this way of thinking over to this side where we're thinking about what it means to have an experience as humans and what conditions give rise to that humanity, okay? And it's not because this stuff is uh, bad or terrible or flawed or faulty, it's just that in order to be what it is, it has to be representational. It has to be very precise and exact. And, and so, uh, but here's what I'm suggesting. I think once, once Heidegger makes these arguments and we realize oh, this is persuasive, if you start here, you can't get to these other descriptive kinds of understandings of the complexity of uh, human life. But then I think once we say we can't get there from here, once we have that awareness of the limits of this kind of discourse, then I think what we actually discover is that we can, right? We can find our way back. But I think in part, it, in part I think it will require that we, uh, that we understand fully sort of what we're doing when we're engaged in these kind of reductive arguments. If that makes any sense at all, that's, that's kind of one of the components. It's one reason why I'm, I'm, I've been slowly working through Galatea again, uh, you know, while I'm thinking about this class and listening to your conversations, because I think I'm going to try to do it by producing a reading of the novel. So if you bear with me, uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll try to get there. Is that at all? Is that, is, am I making any sense at all? Yeah. If not, I'll, I'll shut up. But if I am, I'll shut up. <laughs> well, if you say that there's limits in like the practice and procedures, then wouldn't that mean that there's limits on um, truth? Uh, truth, it, it could be, yeah, it could be. It, it also, it, it probably goes more like this, that truth it provides the conditions within which correctness is possible. So, I mean, okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a excuse to it. Now that you're going to um, have limits on correctness, the, the finer tune that you're going to um, have limits on truth, right? I mean, if that's the um, No, I, I, I think truth will become something that you're not imagining it could be in this in this conversation. Yeah. Truth is kind of, yeah. 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 This, this is a radically redefined term. Right. So one of the things that typically happens in, in, in thought and in Western philosophy more generally is that we, we questions surface for us as in philosophy. Like what's the difference between a that and a who? Right? <laughs> Uh, and and why, what sense does it make to talk about machines who do they? It's a great, that's a great question. And so uh, a lot of times what happens is that we get into philosophical problems and then we invent disciplines to solve those problems. So physics is, is, a, is, a, is an extra, it's kicking the problem upstairs, so to speak. Right, philosophers try to think about, well, is, it, is, is being stable in one or is it in radical flux? Right? Oh, I don't know. Let's get the problem upstairs, right? Let's see, well, how many, how, how, what's the smallest possible particle we can imagine? So, so philosophical questions often require and get turned into disciplines, okay? But what we have difficulty doing, we have trouble doing, is bringing it back from those disciplinary, uh, from those disciplinary, uh, uh, pre those precise disciplinary insights. Right? We have trouble bringing it back and integrating it into our daily lives. And, and in part, that's what I think the humanities do. <coughs> so in part, what I think artists do, like Stark is doing it, right? Yeah. He's taking these, these advances that come from science and technology, and he's bringing them back into his human experience, his human existence. Somebody like Paul Ricoeur is going to argue, right, if you try to keep reducing what Stellark's doing just back to the scientific discourse, you'll miss what he's actually trying to achieve and what the art in his art is actually achieving. Maybe, maybe that way of thinking it will work. What was that name, Paul? Pardon? What was that oh, name? Paul Ricoeur, uh, R-I-C-O-E-U-R. Uh, 
Empire. I'll, I'll uh, post some of his uh, some of his stuff. He got into a, a debate with a, a neurobiologist. You mentioned and, uh, that before. And I've been trying to figure out. There's a couple things that I'm toying with posting. I don't want to just post all kinds of stuff. I want to select something that will work. So I'm still kind of uh, hemming and hawing. But but he he says somebody who thinks about when when he thinks about a problem, he's often thinking about it in terms of levels. So, for example, if we think about language, for example, we can do a kind of a syntactical, grammatical analysis of speech, but that's not really going to help me understand what happens if I say shut the door. Right? I don't really fully grasp, I can't merely understand the expression shut the door by reducing it to its, uh, some, some kind of base grammatical principles or syntactical principles or whatever they might be. Right? So, so, so that's the general idea, that, that something's happening at this level that you, that you won't get to if you think about this as being the level of explanation. So if this is the level of computational or calculative thinking, right, there's something happening beyond that, beyond that level. But can we tie this back to you know, that what's happening at the, that other level is all the things we've talked about, intentionality, context, uh, sensory activity, all of those things, mm -hmm. which are part of that real world experience, which is, yeah. Uh, yeah, and again, I think, I think we always, go, I think we're getting much better at this, mm -hmm. and we're doing it much more efficiently, much more quickly, where we encounter a problem in our ordinary life, and then we find that we've, we have these highly articulated disciplines, so, you know, uh, evolutionary psych or evolutionary biology or computer science, where actually the, the kinds of questions that we're, ra we're raising here really can um, be pursued in ways we never thought possible. You know, I, here's one of the really cool things, right? The, the more we learn, the more we make advances in the positive sciences, the more we know about our archaic human past. Right? So, so it's almost as if we really well, 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 the more advanced we become in all of our sciences, and the more consilience there is among the sciences, uh, a point that Lisa was anticipating, I believe, not so much unity, but the more, the more interaction there is among, among the, the, science, the things that we learn from our scientific investigations, the more we're actually going to actually see into the past that we haven't been able to see much into. Like the cave, uh, what was the name of the film? They, uh, <coughs> Forgotten Dreams. Forgotten Dreams. Anyone watch that yet? No, I mean, you should, guys. It's brilliant. Anyway, I'm talking too much. I'm, I'm talking way too much. Is that, Sorry. that useful to you, Dirk? You think you're on track with this one? Yeah? Okay. Let's get someone else. Who hasn't spoken yet? Which group hasn't spoken? Seven. Seven? Do you want to tell us a little bit what you're talking about, group seven? Sure. Um, so we decided to take probably the biggest question from this course as our starting point, and that's what is intelligence? And surprise, surprise, you can't answer it. <laughs> um, so if you go to announcements, um, um, I'm just going to get the two. It's actually just today to figure out uh, how we can break what is intelligence down into something that's actually palatable. Um, and it all came from one of Richard's posts earlier in the week, where he was explaining how he goes about doing uh, his artwork and what is put behind how he does his artwork. And uh, actually, if you go, because we're on a we're on a wiki. Oh yes. Yeah, wiki. So yeah. if we yes.